Hey, everybody. Welcome to Locked on Lakers for Tuesday. Brian Kamenetsky and Andy Kamenetsky have expectations for THT. Taylor Horton Tucker changed now that he is the team's fourth highest paid player. Plus, how much flexibility does Frank Vogel have in filling out that starting lineup? And is Ben Simmons ever going to play basketball again for anyone? We'll talk about all of that next on Locked on Lakers. You are Locked on Lakers. Your daily Los Angeles Lakers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yeah, Andy, there was uh, once a time when there was a question as to whether a certain Lakers star would show up to training camp. Um, echoes of the situation that's that's playing out in Philly right now. Um, yeah, we were right in the middle of that, man. Turned out very differently. So um, in the era of player empowerment, the Ben Simmons saga is a really fascinating new chapter of that um, obviously all relates to uh, star driven teams like the Lakers. So uh, we will get to that later in the show, but first Andy want to thank everybody for making locked on Lakers. Your first listen of every day, really appreciate it. Monday through Friday, a new podcast every day as the season kicks off. Remember to, uh, to subscribe to locked on Lakers on YouTube uh, to get all the breaking news and see the podcast early. We usually drop it there before it ends up on the uh I don't know, wherever you get your podcasts. So, you know, we talked on Monday's show about the the preseason game on Sunday and the Lakers lose, and we broke that down a little bit. And some of the response to it, though, has been pretty interesting. We 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 looked at Malik Monk, we talked about Kendrick Nunn, and we talked about Taylor Horton Tucker. I saw this comment on the Locked on Lakers YouTube channel in that video. It said, THT does not make his teammates better. Capitalized, not. This is from Larry G. He makes them less effective. Both Monk and Nunn are better, and both played better that with THT off the floor. Sure, he made a decent play here and there, but he still plays more like a rookie than a guy making $30 million. Larry G, not pleased. It's one preseason game, Andy. Um Let's let's hear. Were you at all concerned by what you saw from THT on Sunday? No, I mean it's a, it's a lot of what I would expect from THT as a developing player, particularly playing without LeBron James and without Russell Westbrook, um, and largely without Anthony Davis. You know, not just the three best players on the Lakers, three biggest focal points for opposing defenses, but also the two primary playmakers and initiators on this team. And while the Lakers are obviously looking for and frankly need Talon Horton Tucker to take steps forward in being, you know, a secondary initiator for, you know, a legit second unit, if nothing else, and, mm-hmm. and to have that type of responsibilities. I don't think anybody would expect him to be there yet reasonably after what was essentially his rookie season, even if it was his second year. So, well, everybody except Larry G, but the, the, the larger well, not, point, not just Larry G, man. No, like it's, you it's said. a few. It's a few people, and so w- this is what got my attention about it because money changes everything, and like the perception. Cindy Lauper told about, us that. <laughs> <laughs> she did so wise, <laughs> so wise. Um, she also said that girls they just want to have fun, mm-hmm. and a lot of layers to that one. <laughs> <laughs> That whole that whole debut album, <laughs> a lot going on, <laughs> went over people's heads in the early eighties. We weren't used to someone like Cindy. Nope, it was a deep era. Um, so we Didn't start on know, Shebop. So we <laughs> we're in a it's situation though. You 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 pointed it out though. This is worse than I couldn't get through the cold open on Monday's show. You, you, uh, you, you talked about the the expectations. The Lakers have legitimate need for THT to to do some stuff this year. At the very least, it would be awfully helpful uh, if he were a you know legitimate, you know, very solid member of a championship caliber team's rotation. Like that's, but he, you know, it, when you when you look at it, he didn't suddenly get much more experienced. He didn't play an extra 75 NBA games in the offseason just because the Lakers paid him. But this is going to be part of the discussion, part of the conversation around THT all year long. It's like, okay, it was fun when you were a second round pick that was making half a million or whatever it was. And, you know, the Lakers could keep you around and you were all potential and 
They weren't making roster decisions based on how much money they got to pay you. All of that's gone. Like he's the fourth highest player paid player on this team and expectations are going to rise accordingly. I am fascinated to see how that impact impacts the way that sort of collectively we NBA, you know, observers, all that look at THT and how he's playing. Yeah. I mean, I, I've made this point a lot, Brian, like the, the comparison that keeps coming to mind for me is Andrew Bynum. Uh, coming into the 2007-2008 season, which interestingly enough, later in the show, we're going to end up discussing because there was a lot happening in that season. But, yeah. you know, like with with Bynum, the, you know, while that er, while that leap was not expected, you know, no nobody saw that coming, including Kobe, who wanted to trade him for Jason Kidd. The reality is the urgency for it to happen was actually higher during that season because th- that team didn't have the same depth of this team, you know, that team had MVP, you know, peak Kobe, a very good Lamar Odom, mm-hmm. and then, you know, a cast of role players of varying degrees of talent. This team, this team has much more. Wame Brown and the, the rights to fat Marcus All. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> for, for example. But yeah. like, you know, th- this team has more of a, of a star laden foundation, but in terms of, of, Shrinking that gap between LeBron, AD, Russell Westbrook, and everybody else, I think there is some expectation. Uh, apologies, by the way, if people can hear a uh, noise from outside my place. Our back stairs are getting fixed. This is where it's happening. Just letting you y'all know what it is. Um, but anyway, just th- there is there's a need for THT, even if it's in the same urgency. Th- they need him to to step up. They need him to provide utility. They're they're looking. There, even though that contract is in some ways a look towards the entirety of its three years, there's a now factor. Oh, there, like there they, is. You know, there this, is. This is a but contending I, team. I, I, to me, they're almost they're almost two separate issues. Like there is the yes, they need him to be better. I like, but how much better? Like, where does he need to fit in? And then there's the way that people are going to look at him as this guy that they paid, that they chose him over Caruso. However, you want to frame it, and. The the there are expectations on him that I think will be kind of you know hopefully he handles it really well he kind of rises to, by all rights like it's not like a lack of gym time it's not a lack of work ethic it's not be anything that if he doesn't get to where he goes but like it's it's he's the the difference between him and Bynum for example in the example you gave is that Bynum hadn't been paid yet mm-hmm. and and so he you know that makes a huge difference. Um, in terms of the way that people look at you, THT got paid on potential, not paid on production. And the, the, the way he responds this year, if he has a stretch of games, three of 11 on Sunday, some inconsistent play, some great finishes and, all, and some good stuff, but a lot of inconsistency, the tolerance for that, I think, and some of the, the shine on THT is going to where I don't think it's fair. Because he's still 20 and he still basically hasn't even played a full NBA season's worth of games as a real member of a rotation. Um, but that fair ain't got nothing to do with this. Well, here's where I'll tell you it actually is fair, is in the sense that you and I both uh, assume, and I, I think it's going to be an accurate assumption, that TAT is going to get a lot of playing time this year. They're going like to try. He, he, he is one of, I, I've identified six guys on this team, the big three. Kendrick, uh, Kendrick Nunn, um, Kent Bazemore, THT. Those are the six guys that I think are pretty much guaranteed, unless something goes sideways, to get at least twenty five plus minutes per night. So at least in, that's the that's the plan. That's the right, starting that, that, like the, that the, is, the assumptions at the beginning of the yes, year. I one hundred percent agree. Yeah, that's the way I envision them envisioning this season, at least to begin. So in that sense, it's actually fair. Because THT is going to be given more responsibilities on the court. Mm-hmm. He's actually going to be out there. So whatever progressions haven't been made yet, even if they're understandable, they matter. Like they, they're, they're, the, there's a byproduct. Hold okay. Hold that thought for a second, because what is a reasonable jump? Because like, as much as we love his potential and all of that, it is a, it's, a, it's a fair question to ask. How much is it fair to ask a guy who's played as little as he has to... To, to, to make a leap. What does that look like? We'll talk about that next. 
Lockdown Lakers brought to you by DirecTV Stream. So here's the scenario. You got one device that lets you catch the game live, the other one that lets you stream your favorite shows, and then you're watching sports highlights on your phone. Then you got your best friend, sister's boyfriend's brother's girlfriend who heard from this guy who knows this kid that's going out with this girl who saw Ferris pass out at 31 Flavors last night, her login for the good stuff. There's a simpler way to get all the entertainment you love without the hassle and a great way to finally get your TV together. It's called Direct TV Stream. It brings live TV on-demand favorites together like never before so you can watch your favorite sports, movies, and shows all in one place. No more juggling remotes. No more need to buy another device ever again. Best part, no annual contracts. So get rid of the color confusion. Get your TV together with Direct TV Stream. You can learn more about it at directtv.com. That's directtv.com. Compatible device required. Content varies by package. Hey, Andy, you're an entrepreneur, right? Hell yeah. All right. Well, this is for you. Shopify. It gives entrepreneurs the resources that are, have been I'm in the backstairs reserved. business, baby. <laughs> That's right. Uh, always reserved for big business. Upstarts, startups, established businesses alike can sell everywhere, synchronizing online and in-person sales and effortlessly stay informed of what's happening with your business. Shopify is more than a store. Connect with your customers, drive sales, manage your day-to-day. -day. It instantly lets you accept all major payment methods. You got to get paid, Andy. It's an important part of being an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. Shopify has thousands of integrations and third-party apps. You're going to flip apps. these back stairs after they're built <laughs> and then get some new ones, then flip that's right. those. And that you just, that, that's how you become the baron of the back you're stairs. You're going to red paperclip your back stairs all the way to like you know a mansion oh, yeah yep. uh, is, this is works from on-demand printing <laughs> mansion purely made of stairs <laughs> to chat bots it's an escher thing uh shopify is tirelessly <laughs> reinventing tools of growth over 1.7 million businesses helping them succeed every day that was actually quite good you reach customers <laughs> online and access social networks i'm proud of that <laughs> with an ever-growing suite of channel integrations and apps including facebook instagram tiktok pinterest and more tiktok is an app the kids use andy more than a store shopify grow, grows with you so go to shopify.com slash locked on nba all lowercase locked on nba for a free 14-day trial and get full access to shopify's entire suite of features grow your business with shopify today go to shopify.com slash locked on nba right now that's shopify.com slash locked on nba so this is the question that i have like what is what is what is a reasonable amount of improvement to ask for a guy who's expected to be better. But as you say, they do have fallback plans. It's not like it's THT or we're screwed here. Um, they have other options. They can sort of afford to shelter him a little bit more, uh, protect him a little bit more. It would just be great if they didn't have to and he could really you know, make a jump. What is a reasonable expectation? What is a reasonable th you know, a level of improvement I'm not, I'm not even thinking so much statistically because on this team, that's going to be really hard to measure given how much star power they have. Larry G's got me thinking. I, I like, What's the right answer here? I, I think before you even look at what uh, THT's improved in terms of individual skills, like how much better of a playmaker has he become, how much better of a shooter, all those different things, it's how fewer mistakes is he making. Like that to me is where I would actually measure, I guess, how much tolerance you have for some of this stuff. Cutting you know, down, like, you're essentially saying cutting down on the downside as a, it's as, as, as important as raising the upside. I, I think in some ways it's actually more important because hmm. it, he obviously has to get better in certain skill sets, particularly the ones that they're counting on him uh, displaying when he's out on the floor. But what will really hurt him in terms of the overall effect on the team, but also just his ability to stay on the floor are mistakes. And I, I think particularly defensive mistakes. Like he, he's got to become more accountable defending off ball, being able to, you know, watch a guy and, and not get back cut to death like we saw last year. You know, like his on ball defense, I think was not bad for somebody of his relative or not even relative actual inexperience 19 years old yeah 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 he, he was inexperienced there's no need to qualify that on my part he was inexperienced and for a 19 year old i thought his on ball defense was not too bad his off ball defense was often a train wreck and that has to go away you know he's he's got to make sure that some of the tunnel vision habits that he has uh that those start dissipating more like that to me for example would qualify as a mistake as opposed to just pure skill set type of thing. It's and this 
you know, this is what Larry was getting at. Like there's the, the, the inconsistencies of a 20 year old, um, are well documented. Yeah, I'm not talking about 20 year old basketball players. I'm talking about 20 year old humans. Um, and you know, it's it is, you know, <laughs> decisions with the ball. I think are important. Mistakes he makes away from the ball defensively, like you say, um, are big. Russell Westbrook still struggles with that, though. So it's not like these things are easy. NBA NBA defense is incredibly complicated, and I, I think that is something that. <clears throat> fans don't always give enough consideration to um it's really hard it is this stuff is hard and you know especially the, with the, with the way this league is now so spread out in how offensive gets offenses get run man you have so much ground to account for and to keep track of and it's and it's and it's, it's you hard don't, and i'm not talking just about him i'm malik monk whoever you're talking like it you don't have to be wrong by five seconds you have to be wrong by half a second, by a quarter of a second, by, you know, not anticipating what's coming before it happens. And th that involves a tremendous amount of experience. There's a reason somebody like Trevor Ariza or Dwight Howard um, or these guys who have aged considerably in their careers can still remain good to very good defenders, even as their athleticism starts to go down. You could say the same thing about LeBron. Um, not that he can't crank it up, but you understand what I mean? Like th the knowledge base that these guys have in terms of how to do it is so high that they can compensate in a lot of ways. Marcus all was good at that. It's, it's, it's unreasonable to expect THT to have that, um, that part of it yet. Um, I just, I wonder too. Well, but here's the thing though, whether it's unreasonable or not, if it's not happening. Happening. No, he's not going to play. Right. I mean, like re you said before, fair has got nothing to do with it. Same with reasonable. I mean, oh, at, the, at the end, at the end of the day, it either has to happen or somebody else has to do it instead of it. And, and, okay. And, and th that actually is a decent seg into the next thing I wanted to ask you because Frank Vogel talked last week at media day. Like the goal here is to find two way players. Um, if you know, Kent, whether it's Kent Bazemore, THT becomes a two way enough guy, whatever it is, that's what they're trying to do is, is ideally fill that role of presumably the shooting guard for sure. And maybe the small forward unless Trevor, Trevor Reese, I guess is this, you know, in the starting lineup, then you're only doing one position, but theoretically you have two open positions in that starting five. Assuming they, AD is going to spend most of his time at the five at center. Right. And start there. If they can't find the two-way guy on a night-to-night -night basis, I think, you know, if they end up with a reason not starting, I think Bazemore is almost guaranteed to start, wouldn't you? Like, yeah. that, you know, you go LeBron, AD, Westbrook with Bazemore at the three and then TBD at two. Yeah. But if over time, like, Bazemore doesn't shoot well or they don't get like that they don't get what they're wanting from any one of these players that they can plug him into that 25 to you know 28 30 whatever night a roll minute a night roll how much flexibility do you think you can have there because there is the presumption that there will be some matchups where you start a traditional center for example you change the starting lineup to start deandre jordan or you start dwight or whatever it might be can you do that at, you know, some with your starting two. Can you do that based on matchups? Can you flip flop your starting three a little bit based on matchups and have a, a starting lineup that maybe is the same sixty five percent of the time, but changes thirty five percent of the time? It's not ideal. I mean, I, I first of all, I don't think matchups typically get dictated one through three. It's it's more about size, and that goes you know further down. The, the lineup, you know, it's it's more about the big men than I think than typically. Well, no, but teams run more. They might spread the floor more. They might have different styles, whatever it might be. I, I again, I, I don't think that's ideal. I, I think in terms of the way basketball is played and the amount of synergy and cohesion that is really required to be so good on both sides of the ball, like the ability, you know, the, the ability to be able to think on your feet and improvise, you know, I, this something I learned about from, uh, I, did a lot of uh, improv training when I, when I was younger. Um, and, you know, a lot of people have misconceptions about improv that just that, you know, a bunch of guys go up on stage, they're funny people, they make up the whole thing as they go. It's not how it works. 
you actually create a foundation for everything you're going to do and you know what's coming. So therefore you can actually improvise mm-hmm. when needed or, you know, when applicable, when appropriate. And the whole thing doesn't go off the rails because you know, eventually when you're going to swing it back to your principles, same thing with basketball. I mean, ultimately, you know, there is a foundational element in there where everybody knows what everyone's supposed to be doing. Everybody knows everybody's tendencies and that allows you to go off script, so to speak. I think the more, as much as these guys all need to know how to play with each other, there are going to be guys that you play with more because that's how you ultimately build your foundation. The more you start screwing with that, the more it feels to me like you have problems as opposed to you are playing matchups. Oh, no, it's not ideal. I mean, I'm, uh, none of this, This, like I said, this is predicated on the idea that they can't quite get that sort of two-way combination or two-way enough consistency that they want, whether it's from Ellington, Monk, Bazemore, THT, to where you find it's a little bit. And I think you settle me, on the best that you have. Yeah, I think that's probably true. But what got me thinking about it is, you know, basketball has evolved in a lot of different ways where like stuff that the teams do now with who shoots and how the floor is spread and all this is vastly different than it was, um, you know, 15 years ago. It's, you know, go back and look at the footage of the Lakers winning the titles in the Kobe Powell years. It's like you can't believe how much more compact and tight. Mm-hmm. Into, like, how are they doing any of that stuff? in like four square feet. It's, it's absurd. Then you go back to the, you know, the nineties and it's even worse. Um, it, it just, it was when rice was a lonely man out there. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> Michael Cooper just recklessly launching two, three pointers a game, <laughs> like some sort of, you know, like freewheeling teenager yeah. on spring break. It's like, slow down <laughs> coop. Yeah. Um, you know, it, the game has changed in a lot of ways. We play positionless basketball. You hear guys talking about it all the time. And that's sort of one of the things that analytics has done to basketball, but not to the same extent that it's done in baseball, for example, where the game has become hyper-specialized for obvious reasons. It's a much more one-on-one game. You can, you know, it's what one person does isn't as dependent on what the people around. I get all that. But there is another level that you could theoretically take this to, to where you try to, match the skill sets of your supporting players. I mean, I'm talking about the the main guys as much, but like the infrastructure around your stars to maximize the stars based on who you're playing. And I th- I, I wonder if you'll get if we'll get even a little bit of that this year. Just a little bit more positional and lineup flexibility for at least particularly maybe when the playoffs roll around where you might see a change based on a, a seven game potential matchup there again it's, that, that, it, it's it literally occurred to me sure today that stuff typically though it. again usually happens when it comes to matchups four or you know most typically five mm-hmm. and i i don't think there's enough variances in terms of the type of teams that you're going to ultimately be going up against on a regular basis that you yeah. would even have to do this stuff in the first place plus before we go just like you are correct that in terms of the way analytics has shaped basketball, like the, the way they drill down on information, looking for different places. Okay, he, he should be shooting here. He should be shooting here. He should be getting his shots there. You know, the bottom line is, though, you still look for consistency in order right. to best bring out that stuff. Yeah, again, it's not, it's not apples to apples. And, you know, how you apply it would be complicated. I don't know if you have enough practice time to really develop the cohesion in the different sets of lineups that you'd want to use and you certainly wouldn't want to even overdo practices it. anymore yeah I, I ideally you just find the guy, guys play well and it sort of solves yeah. that problem <laughs> do um, better and you get what get what you want you get what you want out of it and i think there is an excellent excellent chance the lakers get plenty of of options that are solid in what they want to do this year um ben simmons is not playing with the philadelphia 76ers he doesn't appear andy to be playing uh, ever again with the Philadelphia 76ers. It reminds uh, us a little bit of what the Lakers went through with Kobe um, and certainly is relevant to the Lakers and every other star-laden team in terms of how you think of the player empowerment era. We'll talk about all that next. Locked on Lakers brought to you by Bet Online. Back and better than ever. All eyes are on the gridiron right now as teams turn back for another football season. My God, man. I, I don't get enough time to watch college. NFL has been awesome. <laughs> 
four weeks in. This has been a they even managed really, to turn New England and Tampa Bay into a good game. Yeah, it's That's, just been really, really fun. So as always, go to Bet Online, your number one spot for all the pro and college football action this season. New updated site and interface, more odds, props, and contests. Bet Online continues to be the number one source for everything football. So head to the website, use your mobile device, sign up today, receive a fifty five zero percent welcome bonus on your first deposit. Again, fifty percent. Welcome bonus first deposit. Use the promo code locked on to receive that bonus from football, basketball, boxing, right down to your favorite Vegas casino games. Don't wait to take advantage for all the amazing offers available for the 2021 season. Bet online, fastest, easiest way to bet on all your favorite sports. Bet online where the games start. Do you you don't expect Simmons to ever play in Philly? That's this part's not gonna I mean change, Andy, right? Like it seems difficult at this point. I have learned uh, from the time we spent covering the last 10 years of Kobe's career, which included uh, Phil and Kobe reuniting after a very ugly uh, separation and Phil's very ugly book, plus uh, what we are about to talk about with Kobe going on the radio tour, uh, demanding a trade, going scorched earth on the Lakers, and all of that leading to two championships with said Lakers. I'll never write off anything as totally unsalvageable, but goddamn, this is bad. <laughs> this is really bad. Right but now. like the people, like if you don't remember, like the radio tour is something that I remember where I was when I was oh, listening yeah. to this happening on the radio. I was on La Brea driving north. <laughs> like I mean, I it's like and like you almost had to pull over. <laughs> but for people who, for people not aware, we were covering the Lakers for the LA Times then. So you know, we were we were neck deep in this stuff. Mm-hmm. And I, I like I remember there were the, my then wa- uh, girlfriend now wife um, at one point like I remember she left she had been hanging out at my place left came back and I was still at my desk she's like have you moved today I'm like no nope I, every time I start to just like get up to make a sandwich Kobe goes on another station and says something and I got to go write a blog I, post about it and babysit the comments it's like I, we only had do like, a radio hit myself at the time like, I think there were like three sports radio stations in L A. And like, and, and like, he kept finding like other stations to appear on. I'm like, yeah. he's like, like, why are you on in New Orleans, Kobe? <laughs> like, why are you going on in 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 Oklahoma City? Like, stop going on the radio so I can have a sandwich. I um, Kobe's on fresh air. <laughs> <laughs> Look, Terry. Uh, <laughs> I don't she know why. Why is he questions. on with? Why is he on inside the actor's studio? <laughs> he wasn't into Hollywood at that point. <laughs> We get it. You want to be traded. I understand. <laughs> but like there, th- that was, it was a different era. It was, a, it was a little bit strange. And he was also Kobe. And what strikes me as amazing about this Simmons thing is Ben Simmons is undeniably excellent at basketball. He is a top tier player, but he is not the elite elite. He is not better than Joel Embiid. He is not, you know, I wouldn't put him in the top 10 in the NBA. No. Um, He's closer to 20, you know, which is, you know, 25. And all these guys are in tears. That's really good. But you don't have quite the leverage. James Harden could be an ass in Houston because when it comes down to it, James Harden is a transcendent player who will change your franchise by his presence. Simmons isn't that guy. And so where he ends up and all this other stuff is is really tricky because he's at the beginning of his contract and not the end and all this stuff. And it makes me, you know, as as somebody who sits around here with the Lakers, kind of happy. You can talk about their age and this and that, whatever. But the Lakers have a, a set of stars that are all in exactly the right spot in their careers to make something like this try to work. Like yeah. that part works. The Simmons and Bede thing didn't line up the right way. You got to know it's going to go. And it did. Yeah. And look, th- this stuff is really complicated. I mean, when when the Lakers traded for Shaq and brought in Kobe, like they obviously had extremely, extremely high hopes for Kobe. Like you don't make the type of moves that you did, that Jerry West did for kids straight out of high school. You know, people forget Vladi was a really good player that they that they traded for Kobe. Even if you're bringing in Shaq, you could still have traded Vladi for somebody else. Mm-hmm. You know, they moved Eddie Jones in order to create more floor time for people Kobe. People are still like, pissed about that. Yes, they are. People are st- even <laughs> even the way everything turned out like uh, uh, we are going to get to a what if that we got from a uh, 
from a listener about what if the Lakers yeah, had dying never, to do this one. You're yeah, dying what to if do the Eddie never Jones, Eddie Jones one. Yeah, because I mean, I was living in LA when it happened, and you know, a lot of Laker fans, you know, didn't like that one. And I mean, he's still Eddie Jones remains incredibly popular, but like, you know, they, there's they they did not know necessarily that Kobe and Shaq's tracks would become that parallel that quickly. Mm-hmm. You know, like the idea that Kobe would become that close to Shaq. You know, I mean, even if everything was still built around Shaq and it was still considered Shaq's team, if for no other reason than stature, and there was really nobody else in the league like Shaq. So defending defending and scheming for him became different than defending and scheming for Kobe, even though it was very difficult to scheme for either one of them. Like, I don't think there was an expectation that Kobe and Shaq would end up on that even of a plane that quickly. That quickly. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, that created complications that were both wonderful. They won three championships, went to four finals, and uh, complications that at times became ugly. I, I also just But the difference, is, the difference is, though, with, with this situation, A, both of those guys are better than the guys in Philly, but also mm-hmm. they won before they got to the point yeah. where sort of somebody had to go, like where yeah. the failure came first and then they won. And then it was, it was, the, it was a product of the winning that kind of got, you know, this, this in some ways, you know, it made the egos clash even more. The Philly guys haven't gotten to the winning part yet. And for me, Simmons, Simmons is in the same way that he's in that strange bucket of players who are obviously elite, but obviously flawed. Rudy Gobert is in that from a playoff standpoint, I think you can put Westbrook in there. Yeah. Um, who elite but flawed. He's an elite but flawed guy in the in the player empowerment era, too, because he's elite enough to get a max deal, deservedly, but not so elite that you actually want to acquire him. Well, you he's know what's a difficult funny? I mean, guy to trade. He he's difficult to trade in the sense that he, like he is still somebody that I can understand where teams around the league would would think you could build around him as a table setter and as a truly elite defensive foundation. I mean, he is one of the best defenders in the league. If you built specifically around him and tailored everything around him, he could be a a very specific number one. But again, it requires specificity. It requires a lot of stuff either already in place or the ability to be really fluid with a, with a, quick roster reconstruction it's sort of like Uh, it's like it's it's a little like creating your roster around lamar jackson it's like it's it's not you know jackson is i think a little more versatile uh, and and skilled in traditional ways and he gets credit for for all sorts of reasons um but he is a specific kind of player and a specific quarterback that you would want to build an attack around by the way i should have been more specific Simmons is really hard to trade if you want to stay good. If you want a package of rebuilding stuff, then he's actually probably pretty easy to trade. Philly's trying to remain elite. Yeah. So yeah. that's the that's the distinction I should have been. Well, I mean, to. look, that that was part of the issue that the Lakers had, you know, bringing this back to Kobe and the radio tour, you know, part of the issues that they had in terms of getting the best support system around Kobe was they they needed to be competitive to satisfy Kobe. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, like they didn't have a lot of those type of pieces. And the best one they had was Andrew Bynum, who, as it turned out, they were correct, was a very good basketball player. You know, unfortunately, injuries took it out of him early, but he he was clearly a talented guy. And the leap ultimately ended up quicker than they thought it would. You know, what, I'm sorry. What jumped, yeah, what, you... what jumped out at me, though, that I thought was really interesting about this in terms of comparing it to Kobe with Ben Simmons was the idea of like what would have happened with Kobe making this demand in the player empowerment era. Like, you know, like, cause Kobe had a hell of a lot of juice back then. I mean, you know, Kobe was arguably the most powerful player in the league when he made this demand, but the league itself had changed. So like I thought about, okay, would Kobe have ultimately showed up to training camp? You know, cause like that was a big storyline heading in the media day. And, you know, we both saw this, like people legitimately Kwame Didn't Brown asked it. us if, if yes. it's like, dude, you were the one in the locker room. Like, yeah. I mean, he's not going to he, tell us before he tells you. Right. And like, you know, whether Kobe ultimately showed up out of professionalism or even somebody of his status feeling not quite empowered enough to, uh, to skip all of training camp to really, you know, do what Rick Buecher had reported, which was he will never put on a Laker uniform again, even though honestly, I don't think the Lakers would have fined him, but like, 
either way, like wondering if this had happened 15 years later, mm -hmm. would Kobe have taken that step that might have made it nuclear? The other thing about it, though, that I thought really ironic was that Kobe's contract, even though it wasn't in the player empowerment era, it was ironically so empowered because he had this no trade clause, it actually prevented him from getting traded. Because yes. like, even though Dr. Buss didn't want to trade Kobe, like legitimately didn't want to, the no trade clause really made it so he couldn't because basically it was Kobe and Dr. Buss negotiating with other teams and like you know right because Kobe didn't Kobe, Kobe didn't want to go somewhere where his team wouldn't be good enough for him to win but for the Lakers and this is the Lakers this is where context really makes a big difference the Lakers were in a position where they are in the the Lakers were where Philly is where they they couldn't trade Kobe for 600 draft picks and the three best young prospects you have or whatever the the framework would have been equivalent of that day they had to, they wanted to still be if you're going to trade kobe you got to get something that keeps you good back and that couldn't be done with the contract with the no trade clause and all that it makes me wonder like what would have happened if washington wasn't if washington was a high-end contender but for some reason Westbrook just really wanted to play in LA. Like, can you get me to, to the Lakers? Like, I don't think Washington can construct a deal where they, you know, go to Kuzma and Harrell and whatever, open up that kind of flexibility, which hopefully lets them get better over the next couple of years. Like context ends up so important with yeah. these things. And Ben Simmons walked into a context where he kind of can't get traded. It's I, I have no idea where this goes. Um, yeah, I think he ultimately will get traded. Um, and this is the last really big difference, I think, between Kobe, Kobe and Simmons. Kobe was not bluffing with all this stuff, and he was not trying to like light nope. a fire was, under the organization. Happy to go, he would have gone to the Clippers. He right. He wanted to be traded, but he didn't really want to leave. Like if that makes sense. Like in his I heart of hearts, he wanted to be a Laker, but he just didn't think it was feasible anymore. Ben Simmons wants to get the hell out of there. And that is a really, <laughs> really big factor. I, I think he's eventually going to get moved. Yeah. And ultimately, like, you know, we could all just sort of pretend that like the, the storyline became Kobe lit a fire under him and got them to to trade for Powell. No, he did. They just the Lakers no. just didn't do what he asked him to do. And eventually we all just stopped talking about it. No, but um, if he didn't have that, it's a great no solution trade. to a lot of it's a great, yeah. by the way, it's a great solution to a lot of conflicts. Just yeah. Stop talking about it and pretend it didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I could say something and I won't. <laughs> Just as if it never happened. Mm -hmm. That's how they did it. Yeah. All right. Uh, Locked on Lakers on YouTube. And reach a uh, high level of power doing that. <laughs> sub subscribe to that. You get uh, breaking news once that's specifically gonna, stated. No, I understand. It's going to breaking news is going to start breaking a lot more frequently as the season starts going on. You're going to want to make sure that you are signed up for Locked on Lakers on YouTube. Scribe, subscribe there to get it as it happens and instant analysis and all that good stuff. You get the podcast a little bit early. And again, first listen every day. We really appreciate it. Waking up yes. with us and uh and uh listening to the show excited about this season and we will see everybody on wednesday